Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good evening, everyone. It is Monday, March the 20th, 2023. It is currently 10 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. And I hope you're ready for a late night sermon review part two. A little earlier this evening, we did part one of a sermon review. It's a ser- it's really the introductory message to a sermon series on 1 John. And if you look at our content on the Church One app or the Sermons 2.0 app, you should find that we've done a lot of talking about 1 John right here on this very podcast. And the reason I've talked about 1 John so many times is because I believe there, 1 John is so misunderstood and it is so mishandled and it's almost used as a weapon over and over and over and over again. And that bothers me. So I'm always trying to challenge how people read 1 John. I'm always trying to challenge their interpretation. And I'm just, in many cases, what I'm simply trying to do is like, okay, if you're going to interpret 1 John according to your hermeneutic and according to the way you're handling it, let's take it to its logical conclusion. And your logical conclusion does not leave us with a book that gives assurance, a book that gives us some kind of peace. It's a book that just leaves, uh, should lead any honest person to the pit of despair. It should lead any honest person to the pit of discouragement, depression, and and really just being defeated and want to give up. Because you're probably very aware that within the evangelical world, about 99%, I know I don't have an actual statistic to quote, but I'm going to say, well, far more than a a majority. Well, it has to be in the 90% percentile. It has to be somewhere in that range that most Christians look at 1 John and they will say, it's a test book. It tests to prove whether you're saved or you're not saved. So where do you gain your assurance? From whether you pass the test. If you do this, you're saved. If you don't do this, you're not saved. It's, you look to yourself. And anyone who looks to evidence, anyone who looks to their life, anyone who looks to some test to prove that they're saved to me, is missing the entire point of the gospel. Jesus died for all of our sins. They have been paid for. They have been washed away. They're covered in the blood of the lamb. If all of my sins have been paid for because of faith alone, I've put my faith in Jesus Christ, all my sins are paid for, Well, then there's no way you can look to my actions and go, well, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved, because whatever action you point to that I failed at, that I didn't, I didn't perform correctly, I messed up, they've all been paid for by Jesus Christ. So you would be looking to failure to prove that I'm not saved, but if I'm saved, all of that failure has been paid for. So my assurance doesn't come in what I do or don't do, it comes in the fight and the fact that I have been bought with the blood of Christ. I have been bought for. I have been paid for. Everything has been paid for. I have been bought with a price and I belong to God. I belong to Jesus Christ. I have been adopted into the family of God. I have been ransomed. I have been redeemed. I have been purchased. I have been saved. I have been forgiven. I have been washed. So you can't look and go, no, no, no. Here's the test to prove that you're saved. No, all of that failure has been paid for. Not only that, if we believe it, that we're saved by an imputed righteousness, whatever test you give me, I will say I've passed that. Let's say you use First John as the test book. Well, guess what? I've passed that test because Jesus Christ, perfect righteousness and obedience has been imputed to my account. So whatever you find in First John and say, you have to do this to prove that you're saved, I can say I prove... I. Well, here's all the proof you need. Look to Jesus. And people go, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. It has to look at your life. Well, that completely denies that my sins have been paid for, and it completely denies imputed righteousness. So you basically walk back into Roman Catholicism looking for an infused righteousness. And so I constantly am trying to challenge the way people handle 1 John. But for some weird reason, people say, 1 John is the test book, and the if you pass the test, 
you get assurance. I don't know how anyone would ever think they passed the test if they're even remotely honest with themselves. So as I have stated in part one of this, let me state it again. If you approach 1 John as a test book to prove whether someone is saved or not saved, here's what you're going to end up with. Either depression, discouragement, you're going to feel defeated, and you're just going to want to give up because clearly you don't pass the test if you're honest. And if you're not honest, and you somehow convince yourself that you're doing all of these things, you're going to end up being self-righteous, condemning, and judging other people. Because the people who hold to the test view, they all think that they pass the test, and they're always walking around pointing at everyone else going, they're not saved, they're not saved, they're not saved, they're not saved, they're probably not saved, they're not saved. And it's like, why do you think you can walk around pointing the finger telling everyone who is saved or not saved because you've lied to yourself thinking that you passed some test in First John? Now, I believe 1 John is a polemic against Gnosticism, first and foremost. It's a test against Gnosticism. It's a test against Gnostic ideas more than anything, but that's a whole different approach. What we're doing is we're listening to this first sermon and a series on 1 John, and what he has done is he has approached this idea basically this way. He says that there is the free grace approach to justification, sanctification, and assurance. There is the lordship view, kind of justification, sanctification, assurance. And he's saying the free grace view is wrong, the lordship view is wrong, and the right view is the historically reformed view, right? The historic reformed view is not free grace, it's not lordship. He went into a little history about lordship salvation, back to MacArthur, 1988, the publication of the gospel according to Jesus. We talked all about that in part one. We're not going to go back and review all of that. What we're going to do is we're going to pick up this sermon at the 23 minute and 30, about the 23 minute and 30 second mark. And we're just going to jump in and he's just about to mention lordship salvation and he's really going to advance this. So I hope you're ready. that That was a quick a uh, seven-minute review, seven-minute getting us all on the same page. I hope that that all made sense. I wanted to go as fast as I can because I definitely want to finish this review tonight, and then we'll look about possibly reviewing other sermons in this series. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see what else we can do with this sermon series. And um, because I think everyone should at least listen to this sermon series. I'm not. I don't know if I'm going to agree with this. Just remember, when I do sermon reviews, I don't listen to the sermon we review first. Because that feels produced. That feels like I'm finding something that I think is bad just so that I can tr- criticize it. Someone sent me this series. I'm like, I'll review it. And then we just turn on the microphone and listen to it in real time and react in real time with n- no prep. So sometimes I have no idea what's getting ready to happen. Sometimes I don't know where the person is going, but it's always fun. So on this late Monday night here in West Texas, where the wind is blowing 175 miles per hour, a little bit of hyperbole, where tomorrow it will be 112. Okay, well, it's going to be like 90 degrees tomorrow, all right? So here in West Texas, it's windy outside. Let's hope it, can we can make this a calm, calm, beneficial sermon review because sometimes it gets really stormy in our sermon reviews because we never know what's getting ready to happen. But let's have a little bit of fun. Are you ready? You got about an hour? You do? All right, here we go. Got something to drink? You got something? Good. I got a pencil. I got a Bible. I got paper. I got iPads. I got Bibles. I forgot my water. Okay, but but here we go. Here we go. Let's get started right now. So with that, with that, how exactly does Lordship Salvation undermine assurance? What? Okay. How does lordship salvation undermine assurance? Now, this person, if you missed part one, he believes lordship salvation is a virus. It's a pandemic. Uh, 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 Really, it's 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 hurtful. It's dangerous. It's a it's a virus that's infected theology throughout the evangelical world, and that it absolutely hurts assurance. Now, I'm going to be I'm I'm going to be very interested to see how he feels it hurts assurance and see what he offers in place of lordship, right? Because so far he's given, he, he, he doesn't like uh, free grace. He doesn't like lordship, but he, he keeps saying it's the, it's the historic reformed position. That's the right one, but he hasn't really defined exactly what that is. 
at which, <laughs> well, there's a lot of ways this could go, but we'll see. Why is it harmful and why does it cause confusion? Because here's what's happened. I've seen this so many times, I can't even count. People just come to me and they just say, John, there's just, there's just something that, I mean, something just gnawing me. Something just doesn't seem quite right, but I can't quite put my finger on it. But I'm just so gnawed at my conscience and I can't have peace and I'm not resting. Now, I think that feeling of something is just not right, something is gnawing at my conscience, something is just not right. I think any Christian who's even remotely aware of God's word, which says, love the Lord that God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, love your neighbor as yourself, and be ye holy as he is holy, will constantly know something is not right because you don't do those things. Something will constantly be gnawing at your conscience because you don't do those things. You don't love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And if you think that you do, you're delusional. You don't. You don't love your neighbor as yourself. And you sure, I mean, everyone should know this. You're definitely not as holy as God is holy. So you're in a perpetual state of disobedience. You're in a perpetual state of sin. So anyone who's remotely sensitive to God's word, you feel that gnawing. You feel it, it, that guilt. You feel that shame. Now, the question is, what do you do? Do you, do you ignore that and go, oh, but I read my Bible. Oh, but I go to church. Oh, I'm better. I'm better than that drug addict underneath the bridge on North First. I'm, I'm, do, you, do you look at other people to make yourself feel better? Or do you realize I'm a sinner? And even as a saved person, you realize my only hope is not in what I do. Or it's not, my only hope is not, it's, my hope is not in what I do or don't do. My only hope is in what Jesus Christ did perfectly. And you run to Jesus and you run to his finished work. You run to his blood and you run to his imputed righteousness. But anyone who's even remotely, if you read the Bible, if you just read the Bible every day, every day you're going to find scripture that says, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this. That's law. And law reveals your sin and condemns you. So you say, then where's my hope? Jesus did all of those things on my behalf. And I rest in what Jesus did. I never rest in what I have done, could do, should do, shouldn't do, because it will never be sufficient. And I will always find myself with that gnawing sensation that I am a sinner who deserves judgment. My only hope is Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you today where that came from. I want to give you three principal ways that lordship salvation undermines your assurance. First, lordship salvation confuses faith with obedience and repentance. This error happens over and over so many times, it would take a book to just put it down with end notes. It's a constant. Let me just give you two examples. In his, in his updated version of his 1988 uh, book, The Gospel According to Jesus, MacArthur continues to confuse faith with obedience. On page 77 in his... Please note, confusing faith with obedience and repentance. That MacArthur confuses this. Now, my thing is, am I saved by faith or am I saved by obedience? Now, now, lordship will say, no, 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 no. You're not saved by obedience. You're saved by faith. But if you don't have obedience, then you never had faith. Well, wait a minute. How do I prove my faith with my obedience? Because faith is believing what Jesus did. But they'll say, no, 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 you got to show your faith by your works. Now, I understand that goes to the book of James, and I understand this. Let's see how he articulates what MacArthur does, and then we we can talk more about this. Updated version, he says this. He says, disobedience is unbelief. I got the... Disobedience is unbelief. Well, then that means every time I disobey, I don't believe. So every time I disobey, I'm not a saved. Because you just, I gave you three scriptures. Do you ever obey them? Love the Lord that God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be ye holy as God is holy. You don't do that. Therefore, disobedience is unbelief. You don't believe. Therefore, you're not saved. Therefore, you'll never have assurance. The whole paragraph, and I'm not taking it out of context. I'll write it in context. 
All right. But he says, disobedience is unbelief. Well, we can ask this question. If disobedience is unbelief, cannot the opposite be equally true? Obedience is belief. If disobedience is a lack of faith, unfaith, then can we ask, well, is obedience faith? You see. Here's another example from his updated version, the gospel according to Jesus. He says, faith and faithfulness were not substantially different concepts to the first century Christian. In fact, the same word is translated both ways in our English Bibles. He says, so the faithful believing are also faithful, obedient. Fidelity, constancy, firmness, confidence, reliance, trust, and belief are all indivisibly wrapped up in the same idea of believing, end quote. That's a confusion of faith and obedience. Yeah, I mean, basically, how do you know you believe? You obey. You don't obey, you don't believe. Well, then how are you ever going to find assurance? I believe because I don't obey. I believe because I'm un I believe because I'm not holy. I, I believe because I know I'm a sinner. I know I fall short. I believe in Christ's obedience for me because I don't obey any well, I never will. I never will. My belief is in the obedience of Christ. My belief, my obedience isn't my belief. Because then if that's the case, then all I have to do is obey, and then that somehow equals belief. Faith and faithfulness. Listen carefully. The whole Protestant Reformation debate can be said to have been about whether faith and faithfulness are distinct. By these statements in his updated version, MacArthur just wrecked the Reformation. Right, it's going back to a Catholic idea. You're saved by your faithfulness, not by faith. You're saved by your faithfulness. In seeking to pull up the weeds of antinomianism, he pulls up the flowers of the Reformation. You see, listen carefully. You got to get this. The classical Reformation position doesn't tolerate the separation of saving faith and repentance, faith and obedience, as though you could be justified by grace through faith alone and not make a commitment to leave sin and follow Jesus at all costs. The, the Reformation position doesn't tolerate that. The classical Reformation position doesn't confuse, also doesn't confuse faith and obedience. Confusing faith with obedience or repentance is to confuse the cause with the effect or the fruit. Okay. Oh, boy. Now, here we go. Now, see, this is where it gets iffy, though. Because now, if, you, if, if, if you're not careful, you're going to play this little game. Hey, we separate faith from obedience. Faith, by faith, we become obedient. So how do we know we have faith? If you're not careful, you're just going to go right back into a circle. Hey, faith, faith and obedience are separate. Faith is what causes the obedience. So if you don't have the obedience, then obviously you don't have the faith. Then in a roundabout way, you're going right back to what MacArthur said. So he's going to be really careful how he does this. The cause and effect concept. I understand. I, I, what causes my obedience? My faith. Well, then if you're saying if I don't obey, then I don't believe. You're really going right back to what MacArthur says. So is he trying to draw a distinction and then he's going to argue back and destroy the very distinction he's trying to make? When faith is confused with obedience or repentance, what happens is this, this subtle blurring of the lines between justification and sanctification. And that is exactly why you've come to me and say, I can't put my, I can't put my finger on it, but something doesn't feel right and I don't have peace. That's why. You see, the harmful result of confusing faith and obedience or faith and repentance, the harmful result is the undermining of the gospel, the undermining of faith, and the destruction of assurance. The call to discipleship is not the gospel. 
Amen. Any of those scriptures that calls to discipleship, that's not a call to salvation. I think that you have to make that distinction because if you don't make that distinction, then how do you, then what's the, what's the evangelism? Well, you've got to, you've got to uh, deny yourself, take up your cross and you got to follow him. You got to deny self, die self and stop following self in order to be saved. Well, then who's ever going to be saved because no one ever truly denies uh, self. No one ever truly dies to self and no one ever truly stops following self. But that's a call to discipleship. I do believe there has to be a distinction from the call to discipleship to the call of salvation. Lordship merges those two. Well, then you have, how do you, how, how do you know, you know, you call someone to be saved. You want to be saved? Here's what you have to do. You got to repent. You got to believe. You got to die to self, deny self, and you got to follow him and you got to make him Lord and you got to do this and you got to do And if you don't do these things, then you are never saved. It, it, it messes everything up. The call to discipleship is not the good news in which we place our faith and hope. Christ is the sole object of our faith. It is in Christ alone that we place our faith and hope. Christ, listen, Christ alone, solus Christus, is the firm foundation of the believer's assurance. So that's the first problem with it, it conf- lordship salvation. It confuses faith and obedience. Second, lordship salvation confuses sanctification with the fruit of sanctification. Too often, listen carefully, and I'm just going to help you. Sanctification is equated with the believer's good works. You'll hear statements like this all the time. We must take sanctification seriously. How many of you heard that? You better take your sanctification seriously. Have you heard that? Has anybody ever told you that? Take your sanctification seriously. Let me translate that. Take your obedience seriously. Take your repentance seriously. Take your pursuit of holiness seriously. Yes, we take sanctification seriously because you're going to see sanctification is an aspect of salvation. We take take salvation very seriously. Yes, we also take obedience, repentance, and the pursuit of holiness seriously. All right, someone in the chat just said, okay, now this is interesting. And I thought the exact same. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sanctification and the fruit of sanctification, two separate things. Oh, I'm down for listening to this. I'm very curious where he's going to go with this. Very curious where he's going to go with this. But we must be careful not to equate sanctification with our good works, with our obedience, with our repentance, with our pursuit of holiness. Sanctification is not our work. Okay, so he's going to go with a monergistic sanctification. He's going to go with a monergistic sanctification. All right. And as someone, I think, predicted that that's where, where this could possibly go. I think he just he's going to make sanctification monergistic. Now, I believe there's an. So let me make sure I help everyone understand my view of sanctification. There is an eternal past sanctification that's completely monergistic where God sets us apart through pre, uh, predestination, election. He sets us apart. There is a eternal future sanctification where we're going to be set apart forever for him. That's that's glorification, right? That's glorification. So you have basically a sanctification that's connected to election and predestination where we're set apart. We have a future being set apart. You could even argue that in salvation itself, when he saves us, there's a, there's a sanctification that takes place there where we're, he saves us and sets us apart. Now we are separated from the, we're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. We're in the kingdom of light. We're no longer as child of the devil. We're a child of God. So, so there is a there's a sanctification that happens there. Now, this practical sanctification, if, is he going to say that's monergistic? Well, that's where um, I think he's going to go here. All right. All right. So someone says, uh, okay, but how does that separate uh, from the fruits? Very good. That's true. Uh, this explanation could be a key to understanding this view. That, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Let's see how he separates this. Sanctification is not my obedience. It is not my repentance. It is not my good works. 
Listen to this. We do not sanctify ourselves any more than we justify or glorify ourselves. Let me say it like this. We don't save ourselves. The, the Bible, when it talks about salvation, uses, salva- speaks of, uses three tenses to speak of our salvation. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's justification. We are being saved from the power of sin. That is sanctification. We shall be saved from the presence of sin. That is glorification. So when we speak of sanctification, we are speaking of the second tense of salvation. We are be, we are being in the present saved from the power of sin. As you sit there today, you are being saved from the power of sin. The Holy Spirit, who is the Lord, the giver of life, the Spirit of Christ, is at work within us to help us fight sin in our lives and to become more like Christ. Oh boy, see, this is where I, things start falling apart from me logically. All right, I got no problem. You want to say sanctification is what God does, and he's doing it now. And now by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's separating us from this, and he's giving us power. And okay, well then, first of all, then any failure on my behalf, it's got to be God's fault, because he's the one who supposedly is doing it. It's not my fault. And secondly, what? How can you say God is doing this, but somehow it can never get be perfect? It can never, yeah, exactly. Someone just said, but how is that not behavior? Exactly. He, he's he's saying he's trying to say sanctification is different from our good works, different from our fruit. But it's he's right back to behavior. God is giving me the power to overcome all of my sin. Well, if He's giving me the power to overcome all of my sin, then why can't I be perfect? Why can't anyone be perfect? Look, I'll, I'll just take three scriptures. Everyone knows the game that I play here because it's it just nobody's got a good answer for it. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Well, then I should be able to do that, but I can't do that. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'll never do that. Be ye holy as God is holy. I'll never be as holy as God is holy. So then how is God working sanctification, giving me somehow power over the, the power of sin when we continue to sin, 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 sin? Sanctification is happening. And we look for anything. What are we going to look for to prove that sanctification is happening? We're going to look to fruit. We're going to look to works. But he's saying that sanctification is different from good works. So how is it not? Hey, it's not. Sanctification is not good works. It's not fruit. But it's behavior. I I, I don't understand. Sanctification in question 35 in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is brilliant. It says sanctification is, listen, sanctification is, I want you to fill in the blank. Before I give you the answer, just do it in your mind. Sanctification is, fill in the blank. Now let me fill in the blank. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. It's not my work. Okay, now, if sanctification is the work of God's free grace, if if, if, if it's the work of God, then why do I take, why why is it my fault if I'm not sanctified enough? Right? Right? Well, why, why am I like, hey, sanctification is the work of God's free grace. Well, then if I, it's like, whoa, whoa, man, you're missing some sanctification in your life. Take it up with God. Hey, you're not very sanctified. Take it up with God. You say, well, 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 you, you can hinder it. Well, then wait a minute. If I can hinder it, then you, then I'm more powerful than God. God, God can only do the sanctification. I let him. Well, then it's not a word. Then, then this, then you're back to a synergistic view. So either it's the work of God, therefore he's responsible. So the lack of sanctification in the church is God's fault. It's the work of God's free grace. 
in his work of free grace, whereby that work of God's free grace, listen, what it does to us. It renews us in the whole man, the whole person, our entire being. Okay, if God in sanctification, God is doing it, renews us in our entire being, is that the eradication of the old nature? I mean, you're getting very close now to being able to say, I should be able to be perfect. After the image of God, what a beautiful work, isn't it? Listen, and it enables us more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. Okay, so now supposedly, now see, I get this. I'm being renewed all through, my entire being is being renewed. And now I, I supposedly get power more and more and more. I don't know why it takes a while, but I, slowly, I get more and more power to say no to sin and yes to God. More and more power. I don't know how five years in, 10 years in, at what point, 15 years in, when can I just stop sinning? 20 years in, 30 years in, 40 years in. It's all God, but we can't stop sinning. See, this, I, I, this drives me crazy. Christians say things and nobody stops to take it to his logical conclusion. If God's now giving me the power to say no to sin and yes to God, then why, why can't I? Oh, it drives me so, it just, it's maddening. Because here's what I know. You can say all of that stuff. That person preaching sins. Everyone in that church sins. Everyone in that church saying amen sins. And I can give you three things. Love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. And be ye holy as God is holy. Nobody in that congregation has ever fulfilled that. But wait a minute. Supposedly, they've been renewed throughout their entire being. And they supposedly now are giving more and more and more of power. I don't know exactly how it increases, but more and more power because it's supposedly all the work of God. So you don't have anything to do with it. So if I don't have the power to say no to sin tonight, let's say I'm going to commit some sin tonight. Whose fault is it? God didn't give me the power. That's not antinomianism. Listen carefully. Our good works, our obedience, our repentance, our prayers, our pursuit of holiness, whatever we do, whatever good work we're pursuing, it does not justify, it does not sanctify, it does not glorify. Now it's back to, wait a minute, so none of our good works sanctifies us. So I guess he's drawing a distinction between the works we do that don't count to anything versus the works God does in us. So if I'm pursuing holiness and I'm doing good works, that may not actually be anything good in them because it's not God's work. So how do I distinguish when it's a work of God versus it's my work? How how do I draw this distinction? How do I draw this distinction? Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. No, that's my work. That doesn't count. That's not sanctification. Oh, no, no, that's God's work. How do I know when I'm doing something, if it's God's work or it's my work? Because my work doesn't contribute anything to sanctification. It's not a part of sanctification. Oh, you talk about utter, utter, utter confusion. All those things are the result, the fruit of sanctification, not the cause. Okay, so so all of those good works that I'm doing is the fruit of sanctification. But I thought he said sanctification... There's a difference between sanctification and the fruit of sanctification. It's not the cause of sanctification. It's the fruit of sanctification. All right. But so the fruit of sanctification is all of these good works. Now now he's making it clear. But and that's all God. So if I'm missing fruit, it's God's fault because it's all God. Uh, he's clearly going with a monergistic sanctification. I mean, it's a monergistic sanctification. That means it's the work of one. It's the work of one. Synergistic sanctification is the work of two. The Reformed confessions are crystal clear on this. This, is, this comes from our church's confession from the 39 articles, article 12 of good works. Listen carefully. He says, although good works, which are the fruits of faith, 
listen, and they follow on after justification can never atone for our sins or face the strict justice of God's judgment. Can't do it. They can't do it. But it says, nevertheless, they are pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ and necessarily spring from a true and living faith. Thus, a living faith is as plainly known by its good works as a tree is known by its fruit. That's how we talk about it. That's the second problem is. That's not really that different than lordship. That really, he's drawing a distinction between lordship, but I don't really see the distinction. Lordship would say, hey, your sanctification doesn't cause your justification. Your actions don't cause your ju- your sanctification, but your sanctification proves your justification. Your your sanctification proves the this fruit proves your sanctification, which proves your salvation. So and around I don't see the major he's trying to draw this big distinction. Hey, lordship is a poison. It's the same concept. How do you know you're saved? Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. And you don't have enough fruit, you're not saved. Hey, but it's not the cause of your salvation. It's the result of your salvation. But if you don't have it, then you're never saved. So what do you look for for assurance? You look to what you do or don't do. But no, no. Only difference he wants to say is you're not doing it. God is doing it. So what do you do? You look for the work and then you say, well, it's not my work. It's God's work. But what if I don't have enough of that work? Well, then, is it God's fault? Well, no, 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 no. If you don't have enough of that work, you don't have God, therefore you're not saved. So what do you look for for salvation? You don't look, you don't look to what Jesus did. You look to whatever's being manifested in your life. Once again, it's it takes your eyes completely off the imputed righteousness. And not only that, it continues to forget that supposedly all of my sins were paid for. If I don't, if I'm missing all the fruit, and I'm committing sin, 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 sin. Well, was my sins paid for by faith in Christ? Well, no, 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 no. Because if you really put your faith in Christ, you won't be committing those sins. I'm going to be committing some sins. So were they paid for or not? So now you're telling me the only way I know my sins were paid for is because I stopped sinning? This is, I don't understand the big difference he's trying to make between lordship, salvation, and this. It's, it's ultimately saying the same thing. You don't do these things. Well, then clearly you're not saved. Now, Lordship salvation confuses sanctification with the fruit of sanctification. Here's the third problem. Lordship salvation focuses believers on themselves and away from Christ. Does it all the time. The problem with Lordship Salvation is it takes the believer's focus of faith for assurance off the finished work of Christ and places it almost, if not exclusively, on self. Now, I completely agree Lordship Salvation does that, but he just did the same thing. Hey, your works are not the cause of your sanctification. It's the result of your sanctification. And if you're not being sanctified then what's the end result? Oh, then you're not saved. That's, that's, he, he may not have stated it that way, but that's the clear implication. We see this problem in Lordship of Salvation when it comes to how these Lordship teachers present the book of 1 John. Probably like most of you, I was raised to be and taught that First John is um, First John is a series of tests of faith by which believers can examine themselves to see if they measure up. So you you take out the test, you take the test. If you pass the test, you have saving faith, and thus you have assurance. If you take the test. And you fail the test, you have to question whether you have saving faith, which undermines your assurance. Now, I completely agree. That's how most people handle 1 John, and I believe it's incorrect. We are in agreement here, but that whole sanctification thing he just went into really leads to that way of interpreting 1 John. 
hey, First John, we're going to test your sanctification. No, this doesn't cause your sanctification, but this would be the fruit of your sanctification. And without the fruit of sanctification, you're not being sanctified. And if you're not being sanctified, well, sanctification is a part of salvation. Therefore, you're not saved. So he's, he's all, in, in point two, he really leads you to interpreting first John as a test, but now he's going to say, we don't interpret it as a test. It is so convoluted what he's doing with sanctification there. And so with Catherine in 1994 on a, on, a, on a youth trip in Arizona in the middle of a lake, I was reading Matthew Mead's horrible book, The Almost Christian Discovered. I took all of his tests, failed most of them because I was newly married. When you're newly married, you're stupid. And you just do stupid things to your wife and you're immature and you don't know how to love a person. And I was just messing up all over the place. Please note, anyone who takes any of the tests, the Jonathan Edwards test, the John MacArthur test, you find the book that gives the test, anyone who's even remotely honest will say, I failed the test. Those who don't think they failed the test are arrogant, self-righteous jerks who condemn everyone because they think they're saved and no one else is. Bad. Didn't know the gospel. Had no idea Jesus died for the sins of Christians too. Had no assurance. Read the book, took the test, put it down, concluded to Kathy, I'm going to hell. Because I'm the almost Christian discovered. I'm almost, but I'm not yet. Was never pointed to Christ. Never. I was never, ever pointed to Jesus in the gospel in the book of First John. Not even implicitly. Never. It's just a test for you to pass or fail. That's how I was taught. My, the, my first teaching on First John was given to me by none other than... John MacArthur. And all I got was test, 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 test. Never pointed to the gospel. Never pointed to Christ. Now that I understand theology a little bit better, all he gave me was law, 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 law. And I ended up going, well, nobody is saved. And I basically had the same reaction he did. I was like, nobody is saved. Nobody. Nobody is saved. Nobody. Nope. I guess John MacArthur is the only saved person in the world because he wrote the book on first. He wrote the study guide on first John that I was using. Well, John MacArthur has written a book called Saved Without a Doubt. And he presents a whole chapter in his book on 1 John as a series of tests. And just so that you know, I've taken my church through all of MacArthur's tests, and we all concluded that we're even remotely honest with ourselves. Nobody in my church would pass the test. Of course, I would, but nobody else. I'm joking. We all failed the test. This is what he writes about what the book of 1 John is about. He says a number of New Testament writers, of course, were very concerned about this matter of true salvation, as was our Lord Jesus himself. The apostle John dedicated his first letter to the subject, stating his theme at the end. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Assurance. Confidence. Throughout the letter is a series of tests to determine whether you possess eternal life. If you don't pass these tests, you'll know where you stand and what you need to do. If you do pass these tests, you'll have reason to enjoy your eternal salvation with great assurance, end quote. That's not the book of 1 John. MacArthur then proceeds to lift out of 1 John 11 tests, and he says John gives us to... There's the 11 test of John MacArthur. I reference them all the time. Wretched Radio gave their, I think they gave 11 tests as well. We've looked at these tests over and over and over. And so what you have to do, MacArthur does it constantly in the test. You do, if you don't do this, you're not saved. 
But, however, no one's going to do it perfectly. So then it's some weird, like, well, you don't do it perfectly, but you can, you, so you, but you can still imperfectly, you can, in other words, not pass the test perfectly, but still walk away with some kind of assurance that you're saved. And I don't know how that works because the tests are stated very dogmatically, but MacArthur then backtrack after he gives the test in a very dogmatic way, then he always backtracks to say, well, nobody's going to do it perfectly. No one's going to do it all the time. No one's going to do it completely. But, 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 but you can still look at this to know whether you're saved. How? How can, it's like giving me a test. I failed the test, but somehow I can walk away because I gave it the good college try. And not only that, that turns all of salvation into what I'm doing. And it completely ignores that I'm saved by an imputed righteousness and all my sins have been paid for. Take a test and examine ourselves. Listen to this, listen to this uh, summary test that he gives us in order to, for, for the believer to assess if he has a biblical basis to be assured. He says, let's review his spiritual inventory. And here are the tests, he says, that come from 1 John. So let's take a test this morning. I want you guys to take your test. Do, do you enjoy fellowship with God in Christ? Are you sensitive to sin in your life? Do you obey the scriptures? Do you reject the evil of this world? Do you love Christ and eagerly, eagerly await his return? Do you see a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? Romans 7. Uh, do you love other Christians? Do you receive answers to your prayers? Do you experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Can you discern between spiritual truth and error? Have you suffered on account of your faith in Christ? If you pass those tests, you can have confidence before God. Do you see the problem? First, the problem is this, is this is not how you read 1 John. This is not how we're to understand 1 John. I'm going to show you that in weeks ahead. How ironic that a letter that is written by an apostle in the New Testament that is written to bolster the believer's assurance is used to undermine believer's assurance. We'll come back to that. I want you to see the problem with all those questions and tests. Here's the problem. All of those so-called tests of faith take the focus for our assurance off the finished work of Christ and direct it solely on ourselves. The gospel in Christ. Welcome. Absolutely. But see, he re- he went through that test quick. But if you take each one of those and re- really consider them, do you really enjoy God and fellowship with God? Well, everyone will say amen. But really, what does that mean? You show up to church once a week? What, what does that mean? What does that mean? You come to church? How many times have you shown up to church and you don't really want to be there because you want to be somewhere else or you're, you're not focused on how much. So what does it really mean to I, well, that you enjoy fellowship with God above everything else? So then why don't you spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not doing anything else, just spending time with God. People say, well, that's ridiculous. Well, if it's a test that proves that I'm saved, I think I've got to do more than show up to church once a week, right? Hey, you, you love the scriptures and desire the scriptures. Really? I mean, I mean, like you go through that test. If you really consider each one and you really take it to its logical conclusion, but what people do is just like, oh yeah, I do those things. I do those things. You do those things, not even 50%. You fall short. Cost. Well, as long as I do them some, then I'm okay. Well, what? so then the test becomes meaningless. The test becomes meaningless. Well, as long as I do some of this, that, what, that, that doesn't mean anything. Either it's a test or it's just a general, well, I mean, I kind of do this stuff. Well, then it doesn't mean anything. Christ is not even implicitly mentioned. Not even implicit. And so what it does, it misdirects the focus of our faith. Lordship salvation, when it does that, undermines the believer's assurance. John MacArthur, in his chapter, and I read it very carefully, doesn't mention a single gospel text in 1 John. Not a single one. Not even implicit. For example, let me just give you one example, because you get this every week in our church. 
First John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, Thomas Cranmer included the fourth comfortable word in Holy Communion's comfortable words for your assurance. So listen to these words of comfort and assurance for believers who sin. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. That's comfort. John's telling us that Christ died for the sins of Christians who sin. He died for the sins of Christians too. These words remind us week after week that believers who sin because Christ has made the sacrifice which has removed God's wrath from them, he's now your advocate before the Father. He's your defense attorney. John says Jesus stands by our side and he answers on our behalf when we're rightly accused of having sinned. When we sin, John tells us that Jesus is not our judge. He is our defense attorney forevermore. Assurance of faith is found in resting in that gospel truth. Christ's death and advocacy for us. That is called the direct act of faith. In the direct act of faith, our our faith is focused outside of ourselves to Christ and to Christ alone, who is our advocate before the Father. And that's where we find rest and peace, confidence and assurance, hope. And so while our obedience, our good works which is the reflex act of faith, can support and lend aid of a character witness to our profession, we don't ground our assurance in such obedience. John Calvin makes this clear in the Institutes. He says, he says, our acts of obedience have no place in laying a foundation to strengthen the conscience. Did you hear that? He says, because the saints... Their conscious of possession, possessing only such an integrity is intermingled with many vestiges of the flesh, right? Listen, he said. And that's so true. Even our, no matter how good we are, it's always mingled with the flesh. It's always mingled with sin. That's why any test you think you've passed, if you even are remotely honest with yourself, sin is all over the place in those tests you think you're passing. It's your, your, your good is mingled with the sin. As if believers begin to judge their salvation by good works, nothing, nothing will be more uncertain or more feeble. From this, it comes about that the believer's conscience feels more fear and consternation than assurance. If righteousness is supported by works in God's sight, it must entirely collapse. He says, because righteousness is confined solely to God's mercy, solely to communion with Christ, and therefore solely to faith. That's enough. I mean, just, I mean, let me finish with it like this. It's one thing to know, how am I saved? It's quite another to know, how can I know that I am saved? Assurance of your salvation is vital. If, if you're uncertain, if you're not sure that God has given Christ to you, you can't enjoy him. Think about it. Can you really enjoy Christ if you're not assured that you're actually saved by him and welcomed into his favor? You cannot live a holy life without assurance. Let me say it like this. You can't obey God's law without assurance. You can't pursue holiness, true holiness, without assurance. Walter Marshall talks about this in his book, The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification. He says, examine your own experience. Whenever you love God from your heart, do you ever give yourself to serve God in love without any blessed understanding of the love of God for you? You cannot love God until you understand how much God in Christ loves you first. 
John makes that point crystal clear in his letter. In chapter 4, he calls us to love God and to love one another. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, he tells us how this actually happens. You've heard this a million times, so you quote it with me. We love because he first loved us. We love. We're not antinomians. We keep the great commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. We don't keep the great commandment. We fall short of the great commandment every day. The fact that you even think that we keep the great commandment is ridiculous. Anyone sitting in that room who says, I love God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul, and I love my neighbor as myself. You're a liar. You're straight up a liar. You don't keep it. No one does. Christ did. He loved the Father perfectly. He loved others perfectly. In Christ, I then obey that great commandment. In practice, I pursue it. I desire it, but I never accomplish it. How? Being assured that he first loved us. Being overwhelmed with the gospel truth of God's love for us in Christ. Assurance of God's love to us in Christ is what strengthens believers to obey God's law. When Believers, listen, we'll finish with this. When believers see, once again, it strengthens us to obey the law. We don't obey the law in practice. I don't know how many times I have to say that. We don't obedience to the law. This is what the law requires a perfect and a personal, exact, entire, and perpetual obedience. A perfect, uh, A personal, perfect, personal, exact, entire, perpetual obedience. You never accomplish that, ever. It's never perfect. And sometimes it may be personal, but it won't be perfect. It won't be exact. It won't be entire. And for crying out loud, it won't be perpetual. ...are comforted and assured by the gospel Think 1 John 2, 1 through 2, or 1 John 4, or all these other passages we're going to look at. When you're comforted and assured by this gospel truth, do you know what happens in your life? You begin to live a holy life. No, you continue to sin. <laughs> okay, that, that's what you do. And when you say live a holy life, again, you can't mean holy like the real, like God is holy because that's perfect. So that you, you, nobody lives a holy life. We are in the pursuit of holiness, but we never accomplish holy because we are always unholy. I am holy in Christ. I'm never holy in practice. The Holy Spirit takes the gospel, which Paul calls the gospel, Right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse, verse 8, he calls the gospel the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the gospel and he encourages you by grace to live a holy life. He doesn't threaten you with whips and chains, but he allures you with the comforting truth that Jesus is your defense attorney. And if you sin, you're covered by Jesus. Keep going. The apostle John knew this, and this is what we're going to discover in this letter of comfort and assurance as we study this wonderful letter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful letter. And there you have it. We will review uh, the next part. We want to, we, I want to see how he's going to approach 1 John, but it's so maddening because on one hand, he's saying all the right things, and then he reverts back to almost a lordship view. Like, in some ways, he's trying to draw this big distinction between lordship, but there's a little bit of lordship in him because he's like, hey, 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 hey. It's not the basis of your salvation, but it's the result of your salvation. And if you're saved, well, now you're going to keep the law. No, you're not. Now you're going to do this. Now you're going to do this. Now you're, you're still going to sin because you still have a sin nature. 
You are a new creature. The old is gone in your position, but not in your practice. Because the sin, uh, you would have to speak of the uh, complete removal of the eradication of the old nature, which is not, doesn't happen till glorification. I don't understand why, why Christians struggle so much with this. We want to believe that we have the power. We want to believe that we can do it. We want to believe, but we fail over and 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 over if we're even remotely honest with ourselves. All right, we'll review one more tomorrow, maybe, maybe tomorrow. I got a lot of things to catch up on, but we will see what we can do. But in the meantime, you can always email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Thanks to the person who sent this to me. It is a fascinating approach. Uh, I can't wait to hear more, and we'll definitely make a good use of this series in lots of different sermon reviews over the next couple of weeks and months. All right, thanks for listening. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful night. Thanks for listening to a special late night sermon review here on the Theology Central podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcast. Please download the Church One app, Church O-N-E, Church O-N-E. Do a search for Theology Central. Choose us as your favorite broadcaster as your chosen broadcaster and then you can keep up with everything we do because we're always live on the air and we're always uploading stuff so please do that or follow us on the sermons 2.0 app now you won't get notifications when we go live on that app so you may want the church one app uh, and you know just follow us wherever listen to us subscribe to us share it whatever you want to do just just let us know you're out there listening thanks for listening everyone have a wonderful night God bless.